Hey everyone. My name is Andrew Kraus. I'm co-founder of the co-founder of EventRight. I co-founded EventRight with Stephen Key over 20 years ago, and we've been coaching and mentoring inventors ever since. I just got off an hour-long webinar, um, and I'm going to spend another hour with you guys tonight. I'm really looking forward to this. I always love doing these these Q and A's. You guys have great questions. Um, we've been doing this during uh, COVID, and I think, Madeline, correct me if I'm wrong, I think um, maybe this is the 10th week I've been doing this. It's, I think it's at least the 9th. I don't know if it's the 9th or 10th, but I just, I just love doing this. Um, I, again, I just came off an hour-long webinar, so I've been talking a lot. I'm just going to get a sip of water here. So um, anything to do with licensing, which is licensing is selling your ideas for royalties. So the big company, they use their money in their workforce and their existing distribution. So you tap into this machine and you just plug your product into their line of 50 products or 10 or 100 products. And um, I always kind of joke, you can have delusions of grandeur when you're licensing because you can do big things because it's not you starting a one product company, it's this big company that you're going to piggyback off. And that is very, very powerful. Of course, there's small licensing deals too. Not all licensing deals are big and not everybody makes a million dollars overnight with one product. Um, Steven and myself over the years, we've been very realistic about that. Um, you, you can license a little gag novelty gift to a tiny little company and you can license a a big tech product to a really big company and everything in between. But um, let's go ahead and get started here tonight. I was trying to ditch the headset, but my uh, my blue microphone wasn't uh, connecting or something. So you guys get to see me all geeky in my headset here, which I'm trying to ditch for these videos, but it doesn't really matter. That's all good. Um, and Anna Bonnie. Uh, why call companies to see if they accept outside submissions? Shouldn't their website mention it? Great. No, it absolutely doesn't necessarily need to mention it. And you shouldn't look for that. If, if a company is in a major retailer where you want to be and you believe your products are right match for their product line, you should reach out to them. This thought that you need confirmation that they're open and that they won't say no or that it should show on their website is, is not accurate. It's what you want. It's not necessarily what they want. So, you know, if you get a hold of the right marketing manager, like, hmm, sounds interesting. Yeah, send it on over. But it, it doesn't mean that the company has decided, oh, we're going to put a page on our site dedicated to inventors. You know, they just get products anyway. So why do you think they should be obligated or you should expect them to put a page on their site for how to submit or whether they're open or not? So you need to make your list of every company that's in a major retailer where you want to be. And you need to reach out to them. And some of them will say no. We don't take submissions. Some will say yes. And then the ones that say yes, we take submissions. Um, a good percentage of them are going to say, no, we're not interested in this product, but then you can license other products to them because once you get in with one, getting in the door, working on your first project, getting in the door with a product, it's a reason to talk to a marketing manager at a company, right? And then when they're not interested, they say, oh, are you, are you open tomorrow? Oh, yeah, sure. And then you come up with another baby rattle or another garden spatula or garden spay or whatever it is you're working on and you're back in there and you've got their email and their name and and you know i mean as inventors you shouldn't be one trick ponies so you know yes you have this product that you're really focused on you think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread but if you're going to contact 30 companies in an industry let's say it's a gardening product and you contact 30 companies you just made 30 relationships yeah, it's a very basic relationship, and someone will remember you when you when you email them. But it is a, it is a relationship, and so you want to um, utilize that again with submitting another product later, right? Um, and keep all that data. Don't lose that. You got their email address, and some of them will have moved on to other companies, but some of them are still sticking around. 
So let's see what else we got here. Um, Jem, say a company wants to license your idea, but it's likely not patentable due to limitations set by US code regulating patentability. US code, wow, that sounds very official, Jem. Um, <laughs> I'm just joking. How do you move forward with a company despite that setback? So Jem, first of all, you're assuming that's a setback. Our InventRight students license stuff all the time that's not patentable. Now, you can always create the perceived protection of a patent simply by filing a provisional patent for 70 bucks. You could literally scribble with a crayon and send it in the patent office and you could legally say patent pending. It's not patented, it's patent pending. And you know, it just looks professional when you do that. And so some industries, yeah, they, they're really kind of obsessed with patents. Other ones, they're like in between. Oh, we want the window dressing. Then some just don't care. So you're making the false assumption that all companies care about a patent or what you're selling them is the patent. You're not selling the patent or a prototype. What you're selling is the benefit of your product so that they can sell that benefit to their consumer. You're not even selling the product. You're, selling the, you're always selling the benefit of a product right? Whether it helps you um, dice carrots without cutting your fingers or clean, clean your kitchen sink uh, twice as fast or with half the effort or whatever it is, okay? So these are benefits you're selling. So um, is every gonna, company going to be okay with that? No. Some companies will be like, well, you don't want a license if you don't have a patent. But you, you can quite often convince them that, okay, yes, the intellectual property is weak, maybe non-existent, but I came to you with this idea. What I can say is in the 20 years we've been around, we haven't had a single one of our students get knocked off by a company that they showed to that would do that. And I think the perception from a lot of inventors is to think that, well, you don't have a patent, so we'll just go ahead and do it. Screw you. You know, it's not the case. Um, not saying it's never happened to an inventor anywhere. I'm not saying that at all. But if you conduct yourself professionally, they, they, they don't tend to want to do that. Now, worst case scenarios, they're like, nah, it's another intellectual property. And to us, patents are really important. So we don't want to do products that aren't patented. But if you think about it, and that might be the case. And so you don't license that company. But to think they're just going to take your idea is not accurate. I mean, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but we don't see it happen with our students. Um, but... Anyway, so I think I think I covered that enough because we got a lot of good questions here. They're really rolling in. Um, so, it, Jim, how do you move forward? I don't see that as a setback. It is nice if you have some sort of patentability, um, but you're also making an assumption you don't have any patentability. I don't know if that's true. Sometimes patent trees will tell you that, and they're not being creative enough in, in what you're going to get a get a patent on. Um, John says, John MC3, reach, reached out to a company for one of my ideas. They would like me to send them a sample. Do I send it? Um, you should never, ever send a sample. Well, not ever. Again, there's shades of gray here, but you should almost never send a sample until you talk to them on the phone. So it's anybody can drop you an email back, say, ah, send me your patent, send me your prototype. It took them what? 30 seconds, 20 seconds to write that. But the fact that they take five minutes to talk to you on the phone, it's never five minutes, right? So it was 10 or 15, but it might be five. The fact that they're willing to take to, a few minutes to talk to you on the phone about the product, that shows they're, they're interested. So it's not even, let's say some people, they have one prototype, they had to work really hard to create it. And the last thing you're doing is send it to a company and they just sit on it forever. Maybe don't even send it back or they lose it or it takes forever and you got another company you want to send it to. Um, but let's say, let's say that's not the case. Let's say whatever you made is really easy and you could have 20 uh, samples you could send out. I still wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it because it doesn't move the deal forward. When you get on the phone with them and you talk to them about what they like about the product, what they don't like about the product, about their company and all these different things, that's moving the deal forward. Now they've committed to you and your project somewhat by just getting on the phone and talking to you for 10 minutes and you can figure out where they stand. And the other thing that it establishes, it establishes that you're a person. You're not just this nameless inventor in an email where they're just firing stuff off for you to do. Send me a sample, you know? Um, also, I've talked to inventors that, that aren't our students. They're students who never do this, but they weren't clear with the company what their intentions are. And they thought, oh, you, I thought you wanted a, us to buy this. And, you know, so... 
getting on the phone, you can clarify your intentions, you can interview the company, you can talk to them, you can establish rapport. You're not doing a deal on this first call. You're establishing rapport and you're setting guidelines for what, what the next steps are. So that's a great, great question. Uh, let's see if I lost control of my mouse here. I got, I'm kind of geeky, guys. I got like three monitors, so I lost track of my mouse. Um, uh, Jonathan, hi, Andrew. How do you find out cycles of the industry? For example, when is the best time to submit in the house or is toy or novelty industries? For the most part, when you're first starting out, I, I wouldn't bother. I would just start submitting to companies. And when they, and when you can, and you can ask them. So when they say no to your idea, say when, is there a typical time that you or the industry likes to receive ideas? I mean, I can give you some obvious things. If it's a week or two before a major trade show, there's a houseware show. You're, you're talking about a houseware product, Jonathan. They're busy preparing for the show. Like sending, it, sending something to them a week before a major trade show in that industry, um, probably not good timing. Um, there are, I think, particularly the ones that you really need to pay a lot of attention to is when it's a seasonal product. So it's a gardening product or it's very seasonal or, or Halloween. Or, and it's not always what you think. It's way before you think. Like you're not going to do Halloween and, and submit something to them three months before Halloween. Expect they're going to manufacture that, license it, and bring it to market for October 31st. You know, they're looking like maybe a couple weeks after Halloween, they're looking for things for next Halloween or even worse sometimes, you know, it can even be even longer sometimes, but not usually. But um, so I wouldn't think a lot about it, but I would do obvious things like don't send a week before if you know there's a major trade show in their industry. Um, and, but I wouldn't even think about that. I would just send it. And then when you're communicating with them, ask them typically, you know, I'm, you could say when they say, no, I'm not interested in this product. Well, I'm new to this industry. Can you just help me out? Um, is there a typically a good time to submit to you guys and other people in the industry? People are nice. But here's, here's what the way you need to think about that. Let's say you ask five companies you submitted to and they said no and you ask them that question. And two out of the five get back with an answer and three don't. Well, that's fine. That's just playing the numbers game. And anybody that's done sales of any kind knows that's how it goes. But this is what the average inventor do. They would ask one company and then they wouldn't reply and go, oh, I shouldn't have asked that. You know, and it's not. A, so. So ask. You know, I, I don't think you need to think about it. Too few inventors actually even submit their products to companies. You have nothing to lose. Don't overthink it and figure out exactly the right month to send it to. Because also it varies by company. It could be in the same industry. And you could ask 10 companies and they give you three or four different answers. Some say, oh, no, we're looking all year long. Some say, oh, no, we only look around this time or we only get together as a group every two months to look at new products, it will vary by company. So I think that's just analysis by paralysis. But once you've been in an industry for a while and you're submitting a lot of products in the industry, to know those things, absolutely, that's fantastic. You should, you should look at that, Jonathan. Um, uh, uh, no, this isn't true. So I, I know I answered another one for John MC3, but this is a, this is a good question. Um, seems to me that there are many companies that run interference or take a fee for submitting to the big boys. Is that often the case? Not at all. Um, I think you're going to the wrong companies. If you're going to invention promotion companies or companies, inventors will help you. And, you know, first of all, that I've never met an inventor. I just talking from my personal experience. I've never met an inventor in the 20 years I've been doing invent right. In the 14 years I've been, I did my inventors association that has had an invention promotion company. That's the way the federal trade commission and the patent office refers to them license a product. Um, so if you're looking for somebody to sell your idea for you and they're asking for a fee, you have to ask yourself the question, what made you think you needed that? At InventRight, we believe you can go direct to the manufacturer, to the company that's selling in the stores where you want to be. You license direct to them. And those companies that are in a Walmart or a Target or a Bed Bath & Beyond or wherever, or for an industrial product, the equivalent, they will never charge you a fee. And they'll, they won't be a go-between. Now, with so that was invention promotion companies and just go direct. 
Now, there are some industries where, um, or some companies that will use uh, a third party. It's, it's not that common, really. Um, and they'll screen the ideas and they get paid by the big company to, to, do, to, to do that. Um, but it's pretty rare. There are even some invention promotion companies when you submit to the, the real company, the company that manufactures and sells a product, that then they're using like a, an engine a submission site that um, helps the legitimate, you know, company that is marketing the products um, review all these products. And when you when they click reject in this little interface that they get, it goes back to some invention promotion. I mean, they came the software for free, and now they're soliciting you to sell you services. But I, I really feel like in in almost all industries, and in, for most companies, you can go direct. But again, like the earlier question at the top of the hour um, was, uh, why don't they have a page on their site? Why don't they tell me they're open? I just want to submit to companies that are open. Um, you know, if you get a hold of the right marketing manager, they're like, oh, yeah, send it on over. You know, companies. So uh, I don't find it to be a big problem that there's all these companies. I think what you're looking at, uh, John MC3, is that, you're, I think you're looking at invention promotion companies. And you should go, there's a good website, inventorfraud.org, that has links to the Federal Trade Commission and the Patent Office site. And so you should be aware of how these invention promotion companies work. And that's inventorfraud.com, actually. So take a look at that site for you as you haven't. Just by and large, my advice, just avoid invention promotion companies altogether. I haven't met an inventor that anything good has come from that for them personally. Um, uh, Edmund says, Aloha from Hawaii, uh, Andrew and Madeline. As a recap for the great IGA webinar with Sarah. Okay, I just got off a webinar that I did. How can we get our products exposure through celebrities? So I just we just got off a webinar. And we had a speaker. I got off a webinar. And we had a speaker that talked about getting your products to celebrities. And and for, for licensing, it's... Um, it's, it's difficult. I mean, if you have a product you're manufacturing and you're selling, uh, you can get your products to celebrities and you can maybe hopefully some paparazzi takes a picture of them or they write a letter back or something and then you can use that to promote your product. But if you're licensing and you don't have a product or a sample to send them or even if you did and you sent it to them and then they they put it on their Instagram because they're just being spontaneous and nobody can buy it, it's going to make you look bad. So with, with licensing, I think you, if you're going to approach a celebrity, you're going to need to, what Sarah came up with this on the webinar I just got off with uh, from is, is said, well, I'm working on licensing this. And if I license it, I'm going to give you a percentage of my royalties if you give me an endorsement and I can talk to these manufacturers about you endorsing it. So that was what she came up with because we're all talking about licensing. That's what event rights about tonight. Webinar I was on was venturing and licensing. So if you give the celebrity a percentage on the come, um, then that is an interesting thing to do for most, you know, like um, Sarah, she's selling handbags and things makes a lot of sense. If you're selling drill bits, uh, you need a celebrity to endorse that. Maybe a cooking product could be a celebrity chef. Um, but you have to figure out if that makes sense. So that was a good, thank you for bringing up Edmund. Um, Rich says, Rich says, what is the best email script to send new marketing managers? Well, I, I can't put an email script up right here, but I'll give you a, a basic approach that we teach our students to use on LinkedIn is don't, even though you know that marketing manager is the right person to send to, don't assume that and let them be able to pass the buck to somebody else, but give you the person. So you say, you know, I'm, I'm looking to license this new gardening product to your company. Um, would you be the right person to submit to, or can you direct me to the right person or, you, or even better? You just say, I'm looking to, to license this product to submit this product to your company for potential licensing. It's a gardening product. You guys do gardening products. Um, who would be the right person? And if they're, and so that way you're not asking if it's them and they're like, Oh, that would be me. Or, Oh no, we sent it to Sally, you know? And so that, that just generally is a very good way to approach it to blindly like 
I talked to a few of our students that went outside of her advice and they sent a sell sheet without permission to the CEO and they got really pissed. They got really upset. So by and large, you really want to ask for permission and they can redirect you. So that would be my advice. And um, that was Rich. Thank you, Rich. Good question. Uh, so we're going to go to 10 minutes past the hour. Um, so we're going to do a lot of questions here. So keep sending them in. Um, uh, Walid. Uh, Walid Baha, what's well, a cool name? Um, Hi, Andrew. Every Wednesday I ask you the same question, but you have never replied to me. Well, hey, I'm applying now. Let's see what it is. Uh, can I approach European companies with a US PPA, which protects me only in the United States? So, so here's the deal. So I'm not an attorney. I'm not providing you legal advice. Seek the services of an attorney before you take any action with filing patents or anything else. So... Um, there's something called the PCT. It's called a Patent Cooperation Treaty. And most major countries are involved in it. European countries, Australia, US, Canada, and they are involved, and many more are involved in the PCT. You can look it up. It's called a Patent Cooperation Treaty or the PCT. And you could type it in if you're curious what countries are part of the PCT. If you want to type that into Google, something would probably come up. So in a roundabout way, in some of these other countries, they don't have such a thing as a provisional patent. But in a roundabout way, you're getting protection there. So when you file, you're not getting protection. You're getting the ability to later file protection. So when you file a U.S. provisional patent, you can file uh, within that year, you can file what's called a PCT. And, it's, and, and that will give you another 18 months to then file internationally. Filing internationally is very expensive. And so uh, even large companies don't like to file around the world. So if you think you're going to file patents around the world and protect yourself that way, you're, you're delusional. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't make sense. In certain cases, it does. But it's just insanely. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands, if, if not half a million or dollars sometimes, if you want to file patents around the world everywhere with multiple variations, et cetera. So, but what's really nice about a U.S. provisional is because the U.S. is part of the PCT. So let's say you want to license to a European company, file a U.S. provisional, and start calling companies the day after you file it, okay, or the week after you file it. That's fine. And if you get interest, you know, you know, hopefully you get interest the first three, four months or something, and then the deal lingers a little bit and it gets a little further along. You still have like five, six months left or whatever. And they, you start talking about intellectual property or patents. You say, well, I'll file a U.S. provisional. And so do you want to file a patent? And if they did, they, you could file a PCT and then file in their in their country. So you're preserving your foreign filing rights. Some um, IP experts believe that it's a good idea to have at least one claim in your provisional patents as other countries have some different rules with regards to that. You know, it's funny. I talked to different patent attorneys and they have different takes on that. But um, so that is in a roundabout way provisional patent that can protect you in other countries if you later file in those countries. So um, if you want to call companies in the U.S., Waleed, and you want to call companies in, in Europe, um, file a U.S. provisional. And that is a technique that a lot of our students use um, because patents are freaking expensive. And so why not file a provisional, fish off the pier, see if there's interest, and then get the company to pay for it. Or if you got a deal on the table and they don't want to pay for it, well, then that might make sense for you to pay for it because you've got this deal that you're going to be signing, you know? So it's a lot more practical than what most people do. Uh, Anthony says, can I license a, we got, you guys got really great questions tonight, guys. Really good. Uh, can I license a product to a company if I don't know if the product will even work? Um, yes. Um, but let's be practical. If, if your invention is a robot and I give this example, it's a silly example. And you're like, well, you should make a robot that jumps up on the roof and shingles the roof so humans don't need to sweat and hey it's cheap and it'll just work all day and it will shingle the roof in no time and the company's like well how do we how do we make that like, i don't know i just think it's a good idea okay that's a crazy ass inventor right but with other products a lot of times you can look at similar products so so let's say so these are some readers and 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 let's say you change the contour of this and, you know, you uh, 
of the glasses and you put some clay here and you, you put them on and you're like, well, it's comfortable. And it's like, you, you know that they can make it. They're just going to make the contour of this a little different. And that's really simple. But there's other products where you can just look at other products in that space. And when they say, how do I make this? You go, well, you're going to make it like the products you normally make or like this product, but you just put a hinge over here. And so by them looking at the existing products, maybe ones they make or ones they don't, and, and showing them the change, it verifies to them like that company's making it. And we just have to make this change. We're pretty confident we can make that change as well. So a lot of times you're only 70% sure they can make it. But if you're like so clueless as to the tech because it's really, really complicated, you got to kind of ask yourself, should I be working on this project? But if you're like, I'm 70% sure, nobody's going to yell at you. Oh, well, you didn't figure this out, God damn it. And they're like yelling. This doesn't work like that. And if they show a lot of interest in the benefit, they're like, well, we don't, we, they just want to push it back to you. We don't, you know, we don't want to do that research or figure that out. But if you want to, if we're interested in this product, we're just not sure it could be done. But maybe they say it can't be done and they're helping you verify it. But by looking at similar products, you can verify that quite often. So that's my point. And it's okay sometimes to be only 70% sure, but don't be the guy with, oh, you should make a robot that jumps up on the roof and you, you've never made a robot, you know nothing about electronics. Don't be that guy. But you can go out pretty far on a limb and it's just your time more or less and the $70 provisional or something. Um, so uh, let's see what's next. That was from Anthony. Great question, Anthony. Um, uh, Sammy says, <clears throat> how many companies should I have on your hit list? You should have every potential licensee that you can find. And for some products, it might only be five. For other products, it might be 50. I've talked to some of our students. They make a list of 100. I kind of wonder at 100 if there's really that many. But, you know, one we used to guide people to have at least 10. And then one day we said 20. And these days we say quite often to our students, you should have 20 to 30. But some we want them to look for the 20 or 30, maybe when doing the research and we teach them the techniques for doing that. And they end up with a list of 12. And we're like, okay, that's what it is. But you looked. You don't have 12 because you didn't know how to do the research and you didn't know how to look. You have 12 because that's just what it is. And But if there are 20 or 30, you want to hit 20 or 30 because it's 20 or 30 chances for success. You know, you don't want to, if there's only two, it's only two chances for success. If you have 30, it's 30 chances for success. And most inventors, uh, they, they cut themselves short because they don't know how to do the research. They don't know how to look and they're just being lazy about it. And they just go with the ones that they're familiar. Like, oh, the Walmart, I saw that. And then I know that company. And they go with the biggest, easiest, right in front of your face companies. And so making your list of companies is a process that I always tell our students can take two to 10 hours to do. Two to 10 hours. Oh my God, it is so long. No, come on. I mean, to run a business, I mean, to start, a company and to sell your own product, you're going to be working 60 to 80 hour work weeks. So to once on one product, spend, let's say eight hours, let's say 10, say 10 hours, 10 hours making a thorough list. So you have 30 companies instead of three, it's worth your time. And you're really understanding the space that your product is in and that industry better. And it's kind of fun. So I think it's fun, but so, you know, don't be lazy about it. Really, really make a, make a bigger list whenever you can. Um, Sammy also said, does InventRight help with setting up a sell sheet? Yes, we do. And, you know, I think I said this last time, I'm not sure, but when people that are, are new students come on board and when they, a lot of them don't have marketing materials yet, and that's fine. The vast majority of them don't have thorough marketing materials. Most, a lot of them, nothing at all. But the ones that do, I would say 95% of the time, whatever video they have or whatever sell sheet they have is not good enough. Sometimes it's okay. But they need to get your product in like six to 10 seconds. And if they don't understand your product in six to 10 seconds, it's not good enough. So our coaches help our students with that. We, we kind of like give the student a framework. They kind of work on it. We, we let our students struggle a little bit with it because we're teaching a skill. We're not just doing it for you because we're your coach or mentor. We're teaching you a skill. The student comes back and the coach says, oh, this is pretty good. But, you know, I think that 
benefit, that bullet point, that's your main benefit. And that, that benefit statement is going down there. I think your thoughts on the pictures are a little off. Let's do this. Let's do that. And then um, once the marketing is spot on, it looks really crude. But then the coach will say, okay, you're ready to go to our design studio. And then our design studio, our graphic designers make it pretty. So our graphic designers don't do any marketing. The, the coach and the student do the marketing. And then the graphic designers make it pretty. So that's how we work with our students. So everything that we do with our students is not just helping them out with that one product. It's empowering them with the skills so they can say, and I tell people this when they ask me about the program, I, I want people to say, I get it, guys. I don't need you anymore. And so we're trying to empower you with real life experience, with real products, so that you can license products the rest of your life. So if we just did everything for you. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to do that. And so we like inventors. You know, you might be obsessed with one current product, but if somebody said, "I don't, I don't ever want to do this again," I would say, "Don't become an invent right student. I don't want you as a student because if it's all right on this one product and you're never going to ever come up with another idea and try to license it ever again, you're never going to use these skills." this real life experience that we give you over the half a year for, with our boot camp. So yes, we do Sammy help you out with, um, with the sell sheets very much. So, but we also teach you a skill, which is the only way we do it. We got to do that. That's really important. That's what makes us unique. Um, okay. Adam says, hi, Andrew. Why do you recommend contacting the marketing department as opposed to the product development department of a company when you have a product idea? Doesn't the marketing team just do company promo? I love that. You guys are asking great questions tonight and you're great topics that I love to answer too. And if you send me ones I don't love to answer, I answer those as well, but these are just fantastic. So um, the product development team and it varies. And some of them are like, oh, that's that's interesting, you know, but a lot of them, they have a bit of a chip on their shoulder. If you think about it, you're doing their job. Their job is to come up with new products and design new products. And you're an inventor from the outside. You see you don't have any real experience there, but you're creative and you're making them look bad. So they're not the right people to go to. And I'm not... It's not the case of all companies. Don't think that. Some companies, the product development department, the people there are great and they're looking at it and going, recommending to marketing. Yeah, this, this makes sense. Yeah. But a lot of them are just there to shoot you down. So it's better if you go to marketing first because what you're selling is not your prototype. The product development people, they're more techie, engineering oriented. And the marketers are like, I just want something to sell. And I know what's going to sell. I saw your sell sheet. And I think our customers would want to buy that. So they're going to then push it on over to product development. And they will still sometimes try to, or engineering will try to shoot it down. Other times they'll be very helpful. And then you just have to deal with that. But if you got the interest from the marketer, they're your super man or super woman within the company. Now, do our students sometimes get interest from the, um, somebody in product development or an engineer there and you can move it forward there? Yes. But by and large, I wouldn't recommend going there first. No, no, no. Um, and, and even if you do, sometimes you go, oh, should I be talking to somebody in marketing too? Oh yeah. Cause, cause they know how to move it forward, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's the marketing department. It's not product development, but you can have success with product development too, but I wouldn't recommend that being your first place to go. Uh, let's see. James says, my question, Andrew is when I have a timely COVID related product, when it might not be as relative in a couple of years. So keeping in mind the time frame, the process takes, what do you think? So um, I've talked to a few inventors that are very unrealistic with regards to um, how long it takes to launch a product. I mean, like we can't, we still, a lot of us can't buy like, what is the N95 masks? Can't buy those masks. So, you know, if, if 3M can't deliver that product on time, for you to think you're going to license a product and three weeks later, the company is going to be selling it to everybody on the face of the planet is completely unrealistic. Um, but to, to work on a COVID related product, people are going to be concerned about germs and getting sick. And for, I don't know, maybe for five, six years, maybe a decade, I have no idea, but it's going to be a concern of a lot of people for quite some time. So I think if you have a COVID related product, um, people will be worried about other 
um, viruses that they can catch or other things they can catch. And it will still, I think it more than likely will be relevant, but be realistic about how long it's going to take them to launch the product. Don't think that well, I have to license this tomorrow. And then I, I've talked to a few wacky inventors that think that sort of thing. And I, I just go, no, dude, that's not going to happen. Um, now, uh, you know, you have to ask yourself, uh, James, is it going to be relevant? And I think for most COVID-related products, I think it will still be relevant two, three, four, five years from now, or at least two years from now. Um, so, but without looking at the product, I can't say. Um, so, but, but ask yourself that question. Um, and, and no, it might not sell as much as right now, but the world is a very... Um, big place and everybody is concerned about COVID. So if just a percentage of people two years from now are still worried about that, they're probably still going to buy your product, you know, and there's going to be other things that come about. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I can't say. Um, so um, Stacy, you know, I kind of answered this question. I think I've been answering this last couple ones, but I love the question. Stacy said, what is the best way to think about ideas? And also, I'll keep it short because you guys heard me say this before if you've been tuning into these. Um, I think most inventors don't uh, do it the easy. They don't, I wouldn't say it's not. I think for a lot of inventors, it just comes very easily. You know, and like you were exposed to something and then you're in the shower and it comes to you one day or you see something. You, you don't even know how it happened. I talked to a lot of inventors about their process and they don't, they're like, I don't really know. It just comes to me. You know, but the, the best way to invent, whether you've got a process that's working for you already, I still think this is a great way to invent, is to go onto Google Images and study a micro category. So go on Google Images and type in, you could type a broad category, but let's say wine bottle openers and spend spend 30 minutes studying wine bottle openers. See, see if it tickles your fancy. And if it does, then spend a full four hours studying wine bottle openers. And you go, oh, there's ones over here on this price with these features, ones over here, ones over here. And there seems to be a gap here. And here's the marketing, here's the price range. And you can spend four hours and become an expert at wine bottle openers. Now, you cannot become an expert at all kitchen gadgets. That's too overwhelming, too much. But wine bottle openers, yes. It's just an example. It could be anything. And, and then you might not even, and you've got no invention. Like try to actually resist coming up with ideas during this process and study them all. And so then like the next day, the next week, the next month in the shower or driving, it just like comes to you like, oh yeah. And you're thinking about it, but you're an expert in the industry first in that micro category is what I've coined that term, micro category first, and then you're inventing. And what ha what's great about that is it reduces your anxiety because a lot of inventors come up with an idea and they have all this anxiety about studying that micro category. And some of them just resist doing it, just want to live in la la land. And, and, and so by studying that micro category first, You've, you've already an expert in that category and you're not going to reinvent stuff and you're going to come up with better stuff too, by and large. So um, who asked? Stacy. So that's a great question. So anyway, so the technique is to get on Google images. So like you can't, you could get on and you could study barbecue accessories, right? For like 20, 30 minutes. And, and then you're like looking to hone it down because you can't become an expert in all barbecue accessories in four hours. But you're like, well, you know, everybody has spatulas. Okay, I'll do spatulas. And you spend four hours on spatulas. And hey, you could ditch it after an hour if you're not feeling it, you know. And and then you start working on inventing some sort of barbecue spatula. So, but it's Google Images because when you type in barbecue spatula or wine bottle opener, you're stimulated with most inventors, probably 95, 98% of inventors are very visual. So you're seeing all these products and you got it you can't just look at the product you got to click through and look at the marketing too. be observant about the marketing what why is this one special what's going on with this what's the price ranges so i love that question stacy i think this is out of the 10 if i don't know madeline if it's been nine or ten but out of the 10 madeline's if i'm not talking to a fictitious person guys she's helping me out with the q a here um uh, but madeline i i out of the 10 live q and a's i've done i think this has been the best questions ever so far you guys have done a great job on the other ones too this is just amazing questions i love these um let's see uh nick says as an inventor and patent holder of an automotive aftermarket product should i complete a full product development prior to contacting potential partners 
No, there's this big misperception that you're selling your prototype. And you're not. You're, you're not selling your prototype or your patent. You're selling the benefit of the product. So, Nick, if your automotive aftermarket product, if the benefits are clear, maybe you do a virtual prototype, maybe you cannibalize something, take a picture of it, and it looks like it works in the picture, but it actually fall apart if you touched it. And there's a lot of different ways to kind of fake it. But if you're fairly sure that it can be made, why are you going to go out and spend five grand making this production-ready prototype when you don't even know if there's interest? It's just nutty. Now, there's some products where you have to do that. They're, they're going to be like, I don't even know if that thing is going to work. And you're going to have to do that. Or you move on to the next product and you're like, well, I can't afford to do that. And I'll move on to a product where I don't need to do that. So, but no, you absolutely don't need to do, do the full product development prior to contact potential partners. You know, if you can look at similar products and go, well, that automotive aftermarket product over there and I'm just changing this. So sell the benefit of the product. Sell the benefit with a sell sheet or a video sell sheet. You know, and a lot of times you can put that off onto them. And if you can't, well, now you got some interest if they want to put it back on you. OK, at least you've got interest. OK, and maybe you can do it very low cost or no cost. Maybe you can't, but at least you've got interest then. Or and better best case scenario is they're like, oh, yeah, OK, we got enough information. We'll go get some quotes in China. Or we'll get some quotes in the U.S. or wherever. Um, I mean, that's a sensitive issue now with talking about manufacturing in China, right? But um, let's be honest, most things are still made in China. I don't think that's changing overnight or maybe not changing at all. I have no idea. I don't have a uh, crystal ball there. But and, and keep this in mind, too, on a side note there with China is people get wrapped up. Yes, the products are made in China, but they're usually U.S. or Canadian or European companies. So you're not licensing to a Chinese company. You're licensing to a U.S. manufacturer that happens to manufacture in China. I mean, you got a, you got an iPhone right here on my desk. I mean, that thing's made in China, but it's Apple, you know? So always, always be clear on that. Although we have had a few students licensed to Chinese companies that actually marketed products too. We had an Israeli student that licensed to a, a Chinese toilet company, but they already had toilets in Home Depot. That makes sense. I had a um, um, French Canadian guy that uh, lived in, um, in uh, God, why am I drawing a blank there? Right by Alaska on the West coast of uh, the Yukon. He lived in the Yukon. So he wasn't on Quebec and, and he licensed to a, a, a whole line of uh, camping products. They launched a whole line. They liked one of it and they said, what else, what else, what else? And they, they licensed like eight products. Um, and they were a Chinese company, but you don't see a lot of Chinese companies that are marketing as well. They're usually just making stuff for American companies. And that that is changing. You're starting to see that change on, on, on Amazon a little bit too. But um, let's see what else we got here. Okay, I love these are just great. I love I love these questions because I know that you guys are thinking about a lot. Of this. That's why I love these questions. Not like I personally love it. I know that these questions you guys are asking a lot of your other other people that didn't ask the question are thinking it. So I just love this. Kyle, would you recommend venturing your product if unsuccessful licensing? Question mark. Um, been at it about a year. Developed the product during um, coaching with IR. So. You, no, uh, most of the time no, but maybe yes. So. You know, to venture a product, I'll give you an example. So the other co-founder of Invent, right, Stephen Key, I'm sure you guys have seen him on YouTube as well. Um, he's done nothing but venture, but license his entire career. But I don't know, if, Madeline, I don't know if it was about six years ago, how long ago it was, but he ventured. He's these little guitar picks. And these guitar picks were more of a novelty. They sold more at 7-Eleven than they did at music stores. And they were shaped of like skulls and Mickey Mouse. And he had it was lenticular ones where it changes the image when you move it. Like Taylor Swift is on there and all that stuff. Anyway, he made those for six cents a piece. And they show, they sold six cents. I think, I think recently I talked to him. He said it was even less than that. And they sold in a three-pack for $2.99. So on a six-cent product, him and his buddies, he went in with a few friends. And they started that business with $200,000 on a six-cent product. And it wasn't enough. On a six-cent product. So people have no freaking idea how much money it takes. You know, you're, you're getting products made overseas. You have to give them that money. It's a long time for the delivery over. And then the, the retailer doesn't always pay you the second you deliver the product. You can set those terms. But, you know, and so it's, it's extremely costly to venture a product. Also, retailers don't like one skew one product companies. They just don't like you. You know, it's, you know, you, but I admire people that get products 
into retailers with one, they only have one product, but you will not stay in there very long. So um, the manufacturer's rep for a big company, type of company you can license to, talks to Bob the buyer, says, hey, Bob, we got this new product and I, I got these six products on the shelf, but you know, I'll give you a discount on these other two. We can put this new product on the shelf and you, your one SKU product, one SKU one product company, let's say you're in Bed Bath & Beyond, okay? And the buyer, and your product is selling well. Who do they want to make happy first? Or who do they want to get those discounts from first? That company with 15 products in their store already. Kick you to the curb with your one product company. You're not, you're, you're not in there visiting them all the time. They're not going to use as much FaceTime because you don't have 15 products in their store. So when you license to that big company, you are that big company. So um, Kyle, what I would say is, just because you couldn't license it doesn't mean you should venture it because you're talking about quitting your day job or your business or whatever you're else doing and dedicating two to three years of your life, raising a ton of money. And really, I don't think it's very practical most of the time to launch a one product company. You can launch it, but you won't stay in the retailers and now you launch a whole product line to in order to stay in business because you're going to work your butt off to get into retailers if they even let you in if your pricing is right if you have enough money if they believe you can deliver walmart's not going to take on a new company anyway um you know they're they they don't they've crushed too many companies that don't understand cash flow and can't deliver on time they you need to be delivering on time quality everything needs to be perfect and they know new vendors don't know how to do that so um, what I would suggest, Kyle, if you didn't license it, is and is to go back and send to all the same companies that said no. Um, if they didn't give you solid reasons why and they gave you non-specific, well, not at this time, not a right match for us, you send it to them again six, eight months later, you get the same person that will say, you know, the, before they were busy because they're just people. It's not a company that's rejecting you. It's an individual most of the time. It's one person. They got a lot of things going on. They, they got a lot of different projects. They get this email coming in. Nah, not, not, not at this time. Not a right match for us. And then eight months later, it's timing. You send it to them again. And they two weeks earlier, their boss said, we need new products. And now they're looking at it. You're like, what? So they said no before. You know, now, if five companies tell you this isn't going to work because of this or it's too high a price, you can't fix that. Don't resubmit. But if it's very nonspecific no's, resubmit, take a look at your marketing, resend in. You got to wait. You don't send it to them again two weeks later. Maybe a person or two might get a little upset, but probably not. They really they really don't. So what you might do, Kyle, if you really believe in it, is, is let it sit for a while and work on licensing another product and go, licensing is my business model. I got a job. I got to pay my mortgage, you know, and I don't know if I want to I don't know if I'm going to mortgage my house and home, put my whole family online, everything to start this business. Because with licensing, you don't have to do that. It's very low risk. You're putting all the risk off onto them. So to say, to put your product before you and your family and take massive risk, you, and some people are down with that. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but you have to evaluate that. You have to be really careful about that. Um, I've talked to a lot of inventors that, I've talked to inventors that were homeless because of what they did. I've talked to inventors that got divorced because of what they did. And so don't put your product before you and your life and be honest with yourself about your skills and what you're capable of. And if you're just excited about the product, that's not even remotely enough. You have to be excited about running the business and doing all this stuff. Like if you're, if you're, and I don't think this is you, Kyle, but if you're timid about reaching out to 20 companies to license it, you should never, ever try to venture it. Because you need to reach out to hundreds or thousands of people when you're venturing it. And they'll beat you up way worse than with licensing, with pricing and all sorts of stuff. They'll put the screws to you like you wouldn't believe. And, and so it's very, very risky. So ask yourself what your business model, if your business model is, and you probably maybe you're like, well, I don't know, I had a business model. I thought it was just, I want to sell my product. And I tried licensing. I didn't license this first one. So maybe I should just sell it myself. Well, if you don't have the money, you don't have the time, don't do it. But if you're like, I love running a company, I'm young, I'm driven, and I can raise hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get started is what you need. And those money people aren't going to give you money without you putting something in. They're going to own part of you too. So I grew up in Silicon Valley. I call it vulture or venture. I call it venture, vulture capital. Um, 
I, it doesn't appeal to me personally. I'm just talking to you personally. Um, licensing is amazing because you get the money, the workforce, and the distribution. So that was a long answer to your question, Kyle. So, but a lot of you that have been trying are thinking, well, if I can't license, I'll just sell it myself. And you can really mess yourself up that way. You could be really successful too if you're excited about running a business and realize what's truly involved. Um, uh, so Annette says, uh, uh, asking about selling, sending a sell sheet to 30 companies, should I do that all at once or should we pace ourselves? No, blast it out to everybody. Why, why string it out? You want to, because you want to move on. If you didn't license, you move on to the next product. Or maybe you just put it in the closet and you send it to all the same companies eight months later. You can string this thing out forever if you're like, oh, I'll do one here and one there. And you will get interest sometimes from multiple companies. It's okay. They naturally fall off. You know, they just do. Getting, being at a final contract stage with multiple companies is very rare. Getting initial interest from multiple companies is actually fairly common. Um, getting no interest sometimes happens, or maybe you just get interest from one. But blow it out, everybody, at the same time. All 30 if you have 30 companies. Um, uh, Adam says, hi, Andrew. Thanks for answering the questions. When you're doing a licensing deal, do you ask for a percentage royalty from the gross profit per sale or the net profit per sale? So you ask for the – the you ask from the – whole. who is that? Um, Adam. Um uh, wholesale price. So it's it's unrealistic to track retail prices. Everything is on sale these days, right? You can't possibly track retail price, but wholesale price is the best. That's the price that the manufacturer sells to the retailer for because that's trackable. If you need to, and there's always, if you're smart, all our students, there's an audit clause in the contract. If you have to audit the company, um, it's easy to track. It's easy to audit. And so it, part of that is defining what net is. Is it minus returns? Is it minus this? Is it minus that? It's extremely common that we get contracts where net is defined it way too broad. We need to remove a bunch of stuff. It's a common thing our negotiation coach, Paul, argues, coaches our student to debate with the company. And um, almost always you can agree on something and they're like, but you don't want to leave that completely open. They get their royalties down to nothing. So we, we really are very careful about guiding our students to define net. But it's on the wholesale price, the price they sell to the retailer for because it's easy to track. Um, occasionally, it's a flat number, but that's pretty rare. Usually, we only go that direction if they bring it up. And then really, I would just I would calculate what that would be in the term of a royalty rate to determine if it's good. Um, uh, to do. Pablo says, is that a new headset you're wearing? No, it's a very old headset. And I was trying to ditch it for this thing, uh, but for some reason it didn't connect. I think I need to reboot my connect. I, I hate wearing the headset. I'm trying to get rid of it. But um, but who cares? You guys just care about the questions. You don't care if I'm wearing a headset or not, right? Um, uh, Andrew, does having one or more inventors on a patent application count against us? Um, no, I don't think that's a problem. The only the only problem is if the people you're on there with is it, you're you're on the patent with are sticky. So make sure that they're easy enough to deal with, people you've known for a long time or people you trust if you're co-inventing something. Um, I don't think it's a problem with doing a deal. I think the only problem is it, problems you might have with them, or they're they want to do one licensing deal and they. They think it's a good deal and you think it's a bad deal or some things to argue about. When you do, on a side note, when you do a licensing deal, you, you do, don't assign it to the company. Um, it always stays in your name. The licensing contract is giving them the right to essentially rent the patent if there is a patent. Ideally, though, if you do a licensing deal, if you make it not dependent on the patent, that's even better. They have to pay you regardless of what issues, what doesn't. And we always try to do those deals for our students. Don't always get away with that, um, but a, a good percentage of the time we can. That's always best. Uh, okay. Uh, and and uh, Bonnie, um, if I have a product for a healthcare industry, companies like Johnson & Johnson, being a big company, should I go with a small company? Um, it's, it's highly unlikely you're going to license to a Johnson & Johnson. Um, you're more likely to license to a smaller company that they may buy out. Um, 
I, I define Google, um, Apple, um, Samsung, Johnson Johnson, Procter and Gamble, 3M, companies like this, I define them as mega corporations. So there are very few of them um, and they're next to impossible to do licensing deals with. Um, and so I think you're more likely to license to a smaller, and that's so, but don't be discouraged by that. There's a lot of very large companies that aren't mega corporations, but they're in a Walmart, a Target, a Rite Aid, a Lowe's, a Home Depot, or the equivalent for industrial products. So, but, and I could count the mega corporations probably like maybe there's a dozen I could think of, you know, um, but they're very, very hard to, to license to. You're more likely to, they wear patents like badges, very difficult. Um, you know, usually you don't even get to talk to a marketing manager. It's just some IP attorney that works for the company that's just trying to gather your information and squirrel it away um, to for their files sort of thing. Um, but, you know, some really big companies, Stephen interviewed uh, Conair the other day. They're a very big company and you can license to them. Um, so I'm just talking about very, very few when I'm referring. You mentioned Johnson Johnson specifically. Good, good luck doing that. Um, and you can, you know, if you license, they're, they, they're more likely to buy companies out um, than to license from them. And so you can, if you really think that's a possibility and your product's going to take off, you can put something in there that if, if their company is bought out, this is what they need to do for you, you know, and you could put that in the contract. Uh, to, to do this answer, like two more. Um, uh, this is a good question from nurse. How long should I wait to follow up? Uh, people don't wait long enough, guys. Um, you should, you should wait a week or two. They're not going to get back to you in a few days. You know, you keep yourself busy with showing them more companies and put it in your, as a reminder system to follow up with them in, in a week or two week absolute soonest maybe two um but but once you follow up and then they still don't respond to then like do it every week i think that's fine and please don't follow up did you get what i send you that's so unprofessional when you follow up you resend them everything you sent them before make it easy for them and they just look down did you get it why would you do that why would you do that i know most of you wouldn't do that but some of you would so don't do that when you follow up always resend them all the same info the sell sheet the link to the video whatever it is like you can take the prior email and then like forward it so they can see oh this person sent me an email before okay better better respond be professional and be very short and to the point um okay Uh, Gary, Gary Von Gary, that's his handle. Um, question, which is more easy to come to an agreement on when it comes to licensing your product, a percentage royalty or a certain amount per unit? Um, I mean, it's all the same thing. One half dozen of the other, whatever, it doesn't make a difference. But I, I think a, a percentage is better. If they raise the price and you get a higher percentage. Percentage is, is, is if I look at the deals our students do, uh, 95% of the time, it's a percentage. Very rare is it like, like you wrote, uh, Gary, uh, 10 cents or $1. Um, that's a little problematic. I would much prefer a royalty percentage, definitely. Uh, to do. Uh, well, I'll answer this last one. Uh, Ragda, is it common to ask for a small cash advance during the licensing agreement? Let's say to pay for some expenses like patents, lawyers feed fees, or that a company to pay for it if they can write it off. So, um, yeah, I mean, getting, getting them to pay for your patent is a common, um, thing to negotiate. And so there's two ways you can go there. Well, there's many ways you can go there, but you can get them to pay for your patent. Why well, spent, you know, I'm going to need to spend, let's say you file a provisional and, and you, you know, to say you have a very competent independent practitioner that can do it for eight grand. That's important to mention if, because you can find somebody to do it for that. 
Um, Cause they're thinking, Oh, like last time we got a patent, we spent 20 K for some, some company that caters to patent attorney that caters to corporations. It's important to, to mention a price. If you're going to ask and pay for a patent, if they don't want to pay for a patent, it can give you an advance on royalties. So let's say they give you $8,000 and, and uh, you, they don't get that back, but it's, they're going to keep the first 8,000 in royalties. So they're, it's showing good faith. So you can do that. So you don't have to have that money out of your pocket, protects them, protects you. There's so many different ways you can, you can go there. Um, maybe you just want a small advance and it could be an advance on royalties, just good faith, two, $3,000 to um, pay for some sort of expenses or something. But to ask for large amounts of money is a total rookie move and the best way to kill a deal. So so don't do that. Now, if you've been venturing the product and you have distribution in 10,000 stores and inventory and all that stuff, okay, well, then they're kind of buying your company too, but most of you are just licensing. And so don't ask for a bunch of front money in that case. So I, I really enjoyed the night. We're, we're coming up, uh, we're about three minutes past. Um, I did a whole hour webinar before this, and then I was an hour call before that. So if I look, feel like it looks like I'm petering out, I think I kind of am. I think I'm just hungry. I didn't eat much of a lunch. But anyway, so I just talk about really boring stuff here. And just, you guys will just all like leave. He's not answering inventing questions anymore. I think I'm going to go. Uh, anyway, <laughs> just messing with you guys. Um, I really enjoy doing these. Um, uh, we will do it again next week. I, we won't be doing this forever. But uh, I don't have a, a date where we'll be stopping doing this because I'm just really enjoying it. You guys seem to be enjoying it as well. Um, so we will be doing this again next Wednesday and I want to remind everybody to take care, keep inventing, and we'll catch up with you next time. See you guys. Bye.